The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Daniel Fusco Ministries. Hey everybody, my name is Daniel Fusco and welcome to today's Real Show. So if you've ever heard about the generation that is under the age of 35, we know them as the millennials, they're always getting complained about from the older generation and especially in the news. The younger generation feels entitled. They don't like to have a career. But what's amazing is, is as I watch that younger generation, I'm very impressed by the fact that they are not content just to get a career and drive that career until they retire. See, they realize that there's something more important than just financial stability. It's called happiness. And even if they've spent years working in a career, working in a field, if they don't find it fulfilling, they're willing to leave it, even at a financial expense, to go after something that they think would be more fulfilling. People say they don't like to work. Actually, they're working really hard, but they're really trying to find things that are really, truly fulfilling for them. Now, I think that that's an awesome thing because what the millennials are trying to teach our society today is that there's some other types of wealth other than just financial wealth. And really the Bible speaks of multiple types of wealth. And today on our show, I wanna explore some of the different types of wealth and to show you how you can step into it. Now for some of you right now, you're saying multiple types of wealth, the best that God would have. I'm really interested in it, but I've never really watched a show like real before. And listen, just join me on this. This is real life for real people like you and I, and we wanna explore what God's best is. So let's get real on today's show. Today I want to give you what I would consider to be a biblical vision for your money, you know, and what I have learned in my own life is that the vision that God has for the expenditure of the resources that he's entrusted to me does not run the way that I think it should. It actually runs completely against everything that I was ever taught. See, in in a lot of ways, what I've realized now is that By and large, the world today runs on an economy of scarcity that you'll never have enough. So an economy of scarcity leads you and I to accumulation. Because there's never enough, I need to make sure that I have enough. And when an economy of scarcity that leads to accumulation, that always leads to anxiety. Because you never know if you're gonna have enough. No matter how much you get, there's always, I need more, right? That's the way the world works. Scarcity leads to accumulation, which leads to anxiety, which is why finances is a single, one of the single greatest areas of anxiety for people. But what I've realized is that in the scriptures, God's economy is not an economy of scarcity. It's an economy of abundance. And abundance... God always having more than enough, us being content to pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. An economy of abundance does not lead to accumulation. It leads to generosity. Because you realize that a God of abundance, that you can always be generous because God will take care. And an an, an abundance economy that leads to generosity doesn't lead to anxiety. It leads to joy. A life of joy. Joy. And that joy now leads you right into the greatest commandment because you can love God and you can love your neighbor as you love yourself without any hindrance. And so I want to talk with you today of a message that I'm calling the wisdom of generosity, the wisdom of a life of generosity. Now, in order to do that, what I want to do is the reason I'm calling it the wisdom of generosity is because the Bible talks a lot about our finances And you all know that the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom, right? If God had a Twitter account where he wants to drop one-liners of wisdom, that's the book of Proverbs. So we're going to look at three different Proverbs today. So open up in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 11. I'm going to start with verses 24 and 25. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, 
And he who waters will also be watered himself. Now, if I were to take this proverb and break it down into one phrase, I would say this, that generosity is the key to wealth creation. That's what this proverb teaches, that generosity is the key to wealth creation. Now, remember I told you that this isn't what you expect it to be? Have you ever heard that generosity is the key to wealth creation before? It's like, no, wealth creation comes from accumulation, me keeping what I need, right? The only way to get true wealth is to get, acquire what I want and hold on to it. No, no, notice what it says here. The person who scatters, who gives away, yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than what is right. Now, when we talk about the idea of accumulation, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't accumulate anything. See, accumulation is part of this, but when you have a scarcity mindset, it causes you to hold on to everything because I'll never have enough. But really, there is a peace, but sometimes we accumulate more than is right. So it's not like the Bible says, don't worry about your future. It says, like, God's got your future. You prepare for your future, but don't hold on to more than what's right. And then it says, the generous soul will be made rich. Now, I say that generosity is the key to wealth creation, but you have to realize that there are numerous types of wealth, right? So we're talking about what we consider to be economic wealth, right? Financial wealth. But you realize that generosity is also the key to spiritual wealth as well. Isn't it true? You know how I know? Because God is the most generous person you've ever met in your entire life. Our salvation in Jesus is an example of God's extravagant generosity. I mean, God gave his own son Jesus for me and for you. Wealth is any form of abundance of a particular resource. And I'm here to tell you that if you have nothing and you have Jesus, you are spiritually wealthy. Isn't it true? And so we should never only think about wealth in one sphere. So there's, there's spiritual wealth. There's also physical wealth. The idea of when you're healthy. We always realize what a gift being healthy is when we're not healthy. Isn't it true? That's when you really realize what a gift it is to, to have a body that isn't breaking down at the present moment. I mean, we all know that all of our bodies are breaking down. But the thing is, is that really generosity is also the key to, to physical well-being. And we don't often think about it that way. That us choosing to do certain things and not choosing to do other things is the key to physical. Now, let's be honest. Isn't generosity the key to relational wealth? See, the reason most of us struggle in our relationships is our culture lives on a scarcity mindset that leads to an accumulation and anxiety and everybody goes into a relationship, what you, can you do for me? But Jesus taught something completely different, didn't he? We go into every relationship, how can I serve this person? There's also vocational wealth. You having a career that you enjoy, that you love, I mean, that's one of the beauties, you know, the younger generation gets in a lot of trouble today, you know, uh, especially from the older generation. They're like, well, they don't like to work. Well, what's interesting is they love to work, but on things that they care about. So in some ways, the day and age of people just getting a job and grinding a job for 60 years in hope of a pension, that's over because they don't give you pensions anymore anyway, you know? And so now the younger generation is saying, I actually want to do something that I care about. Now, that doesn't mean that's always right, but... Really, isn't there a wealth to doing a job that you love to do? I also think that there is lifestyle wealth. Like, does your life have the adventure and the play that it can? We don't live in a society where you just have to survive anymore. Where now you can say, is, does, does my life have the th pieces within it that, is, that I look forward to? Do I look forward to my life? That's, that's a type of wealth. And then, of course, the, the seventh area of wealth is the ability to make a difference in the world. I like to call that impact wealth, where you're part of something bigger, where it's not just about you and your life, but you see that my life has an impact, that my life means something in this world. I'm not just going through the motions. 
And I would tell you that generosity is the key to that as well. Because in order to have an impact in something greater than yourself, you have to live outside of yourself, which is you giving of your time and of your talent and of your treasures. So to get back to that proverb, it really says here that the person who scatters, who is generous, increases more. But the person who withholds more than is right, it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich. And the person who waters, that person who is generous, will himself be watered. So generosity is the key to wealth creation. Listen to what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 and 19. It says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. Now, you notice how it says, command those who are rich in this present age. Now, I want to give you all a newsflash. If you are here today, you are rich in this present age. Now, you know how I know? If you go to the globalrichlist.com, find it online, it pools all of the globe's wealth. If you make, as a family, more than $32,000 in a year, you are in the top 1% of wage earners on the globe today. And so because of what God has entrusted to us, it says, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, command those who are the one percenters on the globe today, in this present age, not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, So don't trust in the money. Trust in the Lord. So he says, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy, let them do good that they may be rich in good works. Notice that, that impact wealth. That lifestyle wealth where your life is full of good works and you're rich in those things. Ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. What a beautiful passage. Now, from there, I want you to turn in your Bibles to the right. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 19, verse 7. Or excuse me, 19, verse 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he will pay back what he has given. Now, the idea here is the person who has pity on the poor or is compassionate to those who are less fortunate, it says the person who does that acts generously, lends money to the Lord. That's what it says there. That you are given God alone, and it says, and he, capital H, and God will pay back what he, the, the person who gave to the poor, has given. I would tell it to you this way, brothers and sisters, you can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. See, and that's the beauty of when you live in the reality of what the Bible teaches, this abundance economy that the Bible is built on, that you begin to realize that anything I give, God will do exceedingly abundant. Now, it'd be very easy for us to say, well, I give so that I can get more, but that is actually the wrong heart. We give because we should, and we can, and we trust God with whatever he wants to do. See, when you realize that you can't outgive God, then generosity becomes a great joy. Because you begin to realize that God has more resources than anybody ever, and I can't outgive God. So I can trust that as I give, God will do what he wants to do. Now, what's amazing is, is for many of us who have been generous with our resources, you experience this all the time, don't you? See, that's why it says, listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. It says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for 
every good work. Now, you see this, how the Bible, it always ties generosity and abundance back to what the Lord has done. See, because we have a tendency just to think about it in the money category, but God always thinks about it in a greater category. He's saying, look, if you give sparingly, if you're not generous, then the harvest that you reap will be less. In the same way, if you were a person who is, uh, you, you want to start a garden, if you put one seed in, you're going to get one plant. If you put 10 seeds, you're going to get 10 plants, right? And then he's reminding, he's saying, listen, you, you, whatever you do, God will do exceedingly abundant. But then it says, and I love this, God wants us to give joyfully, cheerfully, because God loves a cheerful giver. And this is, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. See, so again, he takes it out of the money category and puts it in the spiritual finished work of Jesus category. He's like, look, God who can make all grace abound towards you, because of that, you will always have all sufficiency in all things. He's like, if God can save you, then God can take care of the bill. If God can redeem you, from a lost eternity, then this stuff is small. And we have a tendency sometimes not to think that way. It's an argument from the greater to the lesser. If God can save a person's soul, then God can provide for their needs in the midst of generosity. And then he says to them that you, and I love this, that you may have an abundance for every good work which is the good works that God prepared beforehand that we'd walk in. See, the reason so many of us struggle financially is we're not asking God to provide an abundance for every good work we should do. We just want God to give us a whole bunch of stuff because we think we need it. Right? It's not about how we live in God's kingdom. It's about all the stuff. So we've already seen that generosity is the key to wealth creation, and we've already seen that you can't outgive God, Right? That, that if we sow sparingly, we'll reap sparingly. That when we give compassionately to people who are less fortunate, it's like that we're lending to God and God promises to, to pay back what has been given. Now, I just want you to turn a few pages over to Proverbs chapter 22, verse nine, our, our last proverb that we're gonna take today. Proverbs 22, nine he who has a generous eye will be blessed for he gives of his bread to the poor. Now, you notice it says that he who has a generous eye, literally in the Hebrew language, it, it, it says that he who has a good eye, right? A good eye, right? He gives of his bread to the poor. But the person with a generous eye will be blessed. Now I would say it this way, that generosity leads to blessing. Generosity leads to blessing. The person with the generous eye, the good eye, will be blessed. For he gives of what he has to those in need. Right? So you can't miss that. That generosity leads to God's blessing. And of course, you know that Jesus said it. The apostle Paul quoted it. In Acts chapter 20, that you're more blessed to give than to what? Than to receive. So the same idea is there. Now, but what's interesting is, and I wanted to stop for a moment here on this idea of why they translated the good eye as a generous eye. Don't you think that's kind of peculiar? Now, what I want you to do is stay there in Proverbs 22, and I just want you to move over to Proverbs 23, verse 6, It says, do not eat the bread of a miser. Now, literally in verse six, it says that word a miser, somebody who is withholding. Do not eat the bread of the one who has an evil eye. That's what it literally in the Hebrew says. So do you notice that in Proverbs 23, six, it says a miser, somebody who is stingy. Somebody who is not generous is somebody who has an evil eye. But then back at 22.9, that a generous eye is a good eye. No, I am belaboring this. You heard Jesus talk about this, didn't you? How many of you remember Jesus talking about a good eye and an evil eye? Anybody remember it? 
Listen to this. Right in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter six, verses, 29, or verses 19 to 24 says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, in verse 22, in the same passage, Jesus says this, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad or evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great will that darkness be? No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other, You cannot serve God and mammon or money. Now, you know what's amazing about that text? It speaks about generosity, storing up treasures in heaven in the beginning, and then it reminds us you can't serve two masters, right? You can't serve God and money in the end. And then in the middle, there's this good eye, eye being light, bad eye, your whole body being darkness. And commentators are like, They don't see it as one whole idea. They see it as two things about money with this thing in the middle about your eye. But all they had to do is go back and read the book of Proverbs and you begin to realize that a good eye is a generous person. And an evil eye is somebody who is not generous. Why would they use this term? Because the eyes, the the gate of the eyes, what you see is the place where covetousness is born. And when you look at the world and you say, all I want is what I want, and I'm not going to give to somebody else, that creates a, a place where your life is filled with darkness because of your lack of generosity, because there's always the next thing that you want. Isn't it true? You love your house, and then you go to your friend's house, and you're like, man, my house is not so cool. Man, you love your car. And then you see your friend's car. You're like, whoa, you you loved your phone until your friend's phone talks back to them in an accent. And you're like, my phone stinks. I need a new phone. See, really what Jesus is talking, see, this whole thing is about generosity. See, the lamp of the body is the eye. The eye receives all the stim- most of the stimulation from the world. And if, you're, and if you're generous, your whole body will be full of light. Why? Because you can't outgive God. And when, you're, and when you're generous, it leads to blessing. And because of your generosity, your whole light, life is full of the light of the Lord because God is the most generous person. But if your eye is evil, if you're not, if you're stingy, if you're, if you're miserly, the whole body's full of darkness. Why? Because you do not find yourself in the middle of what God is doing. Because all that God is doing takes generosity. The generosity of Jesus that we respond to and now we're generous. What we're talking about here, the wisdom of generosity is actually an outgrowth of the finished work of Jesus. And I do not want you to try and do life and your finances and accumulate the seven areas of wealth without Jesus, because it's impossible. It's impossible. But I believe that you're here today because God loves you and God has been drawing you. So I realize that each one of us is on a different step of our faith journey but there was a theologian named Augustine who said that our souls are restless until they find their rest in you, O God. And I believe that there are many of you right now who you sense that restlessness and you realize that Jesus is inviting you to come home, to find rest for your souls, to be forgiven. And I think you watch this program because that is what you really want. Now I'm here to tell you, Jesus has been waiting for you to come home. And I wanna give you an opportunity right now to find your way all the way home back to Jesus. So if you are saying yes to Jesus for the very first time, I would just want you to repeat this prayer after me. And if you can, bow your head in your heart, say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. I believe in you, your life, your death on the cross, and your resurrection. 
Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. If you just said yes to Jesus, I am so excited for you. And I want to help you take all the next steps. But I need to know that you gave your life to Jesus. So I want you to pull out your mobile phone. Text the word SAVE to 51400. That's right, S-A-V-E-D to 51400. Someone from my team is going to get in touch with you. We need some information. And we want to get resources into your hands to help you on this journey. Now, don't go anywhere. I got a big idea that is definitely going to bless you. You can take part in the amazing work God is doing through the powerful message that although life is messy, Jesus is real. By partnering with Daniel Fusco Ministries, you help make programs like this available to people who may not otherwise experience the love and hope only found in Jesus. With your regularly scheduled partnership, your generosity can help transform lives forever. Go to danielfusco.com partner now and become a part of the Daniel Fusco Ministry support team with your regularly scheduled or one-time gift. Be the hands and feet of Jesus in your world and become a partner today. So we're just about out of time on today's program, but I love getting to connect with you. Check out my website, danielfusco.com, and make sure you sign up for the weekly newsletter. I keep hearing how much people love the newsletter. It tells amazing testimonies and stories of what God is doing in people's lives, just like you, and plus there's a ton of resources that we want to share with you. I also would love if you pray about partnering with me and helping to get this message that Jesus is real out into the world. Go to danielfusco.com slash partner. Join me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. I'm there. I love to connect with you there. And also come join me at Crossroads Community Church. If you're local to us in Vancouver, Washington, come to our campus or join us on our international internet campus, crossroadslive.tv. Okay, here's a big idea that I know is going to bless you. The only way to live the way you truly want to is to live in love beyond yourself. So live a life of radical generosity and you will be truly wealthy in more ways than you can imagine. Okay, I gotta go, but never forget, although life is messy, Jesus is real, and he loves us even in the midst of our messy lives. God bless you, I'll see you soon.